Jesus, we love you. We want to be completely undone. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do. For the transformation, for the reality of who we are, I thank you that this is going to break things wide open for everyone that has ears to hear. God, you've promised me fruit that remains. Because I have no need to tickle ears. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here to drop a bomb on you. And I want everyone around you to get hit with collateral blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Listen. How many of you have never heard me? Yes. That's like my favorite ever. It just is. I get to travel and I get to share. I get to, I tell people, I, I get to love people for a living. That's really what I do. I just love people. And God loves people. And since I know God and He knows me, He likes to love people through me. <laughs> but here's the key. All I'm doing is sharing the reality of who you are. Paul said something pretty powerful. I mean, he said a lot of things pretty powerful, right? But, but he said this. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The me that Christ, that, that people were imitating was Christ in me, the hope of glory. We are created in the image of God. And that thing got taken away when we surrendered the keys to the devil in the garden. But Jesus restored that which was lost. See, I've got this handle on redemption. I've got a serious handle on righteousness. I've got a serious handle on the reality of old things passed away, all things become new. And, uh, you know, I, I, every time I come to a house, I, I, I just, I, I feel compelled to share where I came from and, and to, and because I start to share and people are like, wow, he okay wow okay great awesome but the reality is, is you need to know how bad to how amazing because see sometimes see a, a testimony a testimony doesn't just mean a testimony isn't just a story a testimony means do it again God really like a testimony means do it again they set up they said, don't forget the testimonies of the Lord. Remember the testimonies. All through the Psalms, all through the Old Testament, keep the testimony of the Lord. Keep the testimony of the Lord. It's important because you can never forget where you came from. But you, you should never, ever, you, it's illegal to look in a rearview mirror and think that that still exists. Are you with me? See... The most powerful thing that you can do, I don't care if you grew up in the church, the most powerful thing you can do is understand the reality of righteousness. 
is understand the reality of redemption. See, redemption doesn't just mean that I was purchased by God. Redemption, redemption means that I've been brought back to the original value that God created me to be in the beginning as if I never ate the tree. See, God sees me as if I never missed it. Well, everybody misses it. Stop thinking that way. Jesus made it so we could have it. And we don't have to perform to get it. It's already ours. But we have to believe that what he did was enough for us to freely receive something that we couldn't earn. There's no way for you to work hard enough to have this thing. There's no way. They tried and tried and tried and even though they wanted to, they didn't. And even though they willed to do it, they couldn't. It sounds like Romans 7. It really does. Because Romans 7 is, you know what? Even though I want to do these things I know to do, I don't do them. And even though I, I, I know that I'm supposed to, I can't. And oh, ah! It's sin in me that's it's making me do it. He's not talking about present tense. He's talking about under the law. We're going to really go after that thing, dude. We're going to really nail this thing down. I... I I can promise you freedom. See, whom the sun sets free is free. See, he's, you're free. See, break every chain is a great song, but it's better when it's your life lived. Don't just do this in a song. Because the chains are broken, right? I've been set free. Come on, man. It's the reality of our life. Are you with me? In life, and as you go through life, and as you learn the cost of things, and as you learn the price for things, you learn that in the life that we live in, here, in the world, the price paid for something is what determines the value of something. If I were to tell you that I wanted you to buy a car, and the car that I wanted to sell you was you knew that it was worth like 500 bucks at the scrapyard. But I told you that I needed you to give me $10,000. That's exactly right. You would laugh at me? <laughs> For real. Think about this. You would say, it's not worth that. You're crazy. What's wrong with you? If we're so worthless, then why did heaven pay such a high price to get us back? Think with me. How much did heaven pay to get you back? Everything. So how could you think that you're worthless? This is really important. Do you know that the first commandment is to love God with everything we are? Every part of us we love God with. It's crazy. The second one is like it. It's to love our neighbor as ourselves. If I love God with every part of me, I have to love myself because that's part of me. And if I have a neighbor that I'm supposed to love but I can't forgive me and I think I'm worthless, I definitely don't love me and I cannot love them. But when I see the worth that God paid for me, that I'm not worthless, that the devil's worthless. If I see the reality of the kingdom the way that Jesus paid the price for us to have it, I will see that the highest part of hell is beneath the lowest part of us. He's the head. We're not. We're his body. Oh. I've just got this like belief system that what Jesus did is enough. I, I really do. It's, it sounds simple and it sounds like everywhere I go, see, see, this is awesome because people are like, teach us how to do this stuff, equip us, you know, to do this stuff. And I do. But my, my priority is to set you free from you. The priority of the gospel is to set us free from us because if we're free from us, we're free from others. And if you're free from you, you can love that. If you're free from you, it's, it's impossible for you to not love you. Are you getting it? Kind of. A little. All right. Okay, check it out. I'm going to roll through a testimony, my testimony. I'm going to share a whole lot of stuff in here. If, 
just listen, okay? I'm going to roll. It's the only way I know how. I don't come up here with a plan. I just share my life. Honestly, I don't, and it's funny because people are like, I, we want to do the stuff, we want to heal the sick, we want to be able to, to prophesy. If you learn who you are, you will. Because it's not about what you do, it's about who you are. Jesus preached the most famous sermon on the mount. It's Matthew 5 through 7, and it's not called the do attitudes. It's called the Beatitudes because the attitudes are an attitude that comes from a place of being. It does not come from a place of doing. We have tried to do and do and do and we need to just be. When you enter into being, you enter into rest. You will not stress because stress and rest, are there, they just don't go together. And it's not okay for us to be constantly in crisis and never in Christ. It's great when we can worship God and, and when stuff is good, but can you worship Him when things aren't good? We have this saying, when you squeeze an apple, what kind of juice comes out of it? If I squeezed an orange, what kind of, or what kind of juice comes out of that? If I, think with me right here, just get this picture. If, if you watched me squeeze an apple into a cup and you drank it and it was orange juice, what would you think? then why don't we think it's equally as strange that when a Christian gets squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out? Woo! We all go through stuff, man. But stuff is not our potter. But if you fail to see who you are when you're going through stuff, it will potter you, squeeze you, mold you, shape you, and you will look just like your situation. And you will say things like this. And people say, hey, how you doing? Well, you know, brother. That's illegal in the kingdom. I'm being so serious. Listen, you know, I have to stop saying it. Hey, how's it going? Well, you know, we all go through. No, you know. Hey, you know, man. I'm like, no. Tell me. And they tell me, and I get to sit there and process the lies that people are believing. Because the only reason that you respond a certain way in a situation is because you fail to see who you are in it. This is powerful stuff. I love praying and laying hands on people. I love it. But true freedom comes when the reality of the lies of the strongholds that aren't out here but are in here get ripped out, torn down, and truth stays here that way the lie can't come back because it tries but we have to see who we are in every situation so that we can thump hell for a living i'm telling you and, and you know what some of you have disconnected already i'm just going to pray something it's a real dangerous prayer in the name of jesus god I thank you for everybody that's disconnected, that you would pin them in the chair, that you would keep their hearts steadfast in such a way to where they have ears to ear and they cannot walk out, they cannot get out of what I'm about to share, that this would radically wreck them from the inside out, regardless of all the issues that we think we have that are bigger than Jesus being crucified. In Jesus' name, every lie be silenced, Every chattering voice, shut its mouth. Father, I thank you for clear air, for eyes to see and ears to hear, so that we can be transformed from the inside out, so that we have no more excuses. In Jesus' name, I promise you freedom. I'm telling you, oh my gosh, you should hear what I'm hearing in my heart. It's so good. <laughs> oh. Okay, check it out. Ready? I'm going to go through my life real quick, kind of, but I'm going to share some stuff. He, he touched on it. He touched on drug addiction. He touched on athe atheism. He touched on some of my life. At 11 years old, I got put into a boy's home. I was put in there by my mom and dad. They split up. I was a very rowdy child. I was really rowdy. As soon as my mom and dad got divorced, I was angry, bitter, and nobody could tell me what to do. And I had a severe problem with authority. And I was my God selfishness selfishness and righteousness are complete opposites 
Selfishness is, is actually the attribute of hell itself. Selflessness is the attribute of Christ himself. And we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. So selfishness must be crushed out. Righteousness must prevail. And it will prevail. And there's a reason why God said in the Beatitudes to th- hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he promised that you shall be filled. If you seek that. This, I, look, I didn't even know what your conference was called. And it says seek first. That's awesome. <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It just happens to be my life scripture. That's awesome. Somebody tell you that? Or they did? Okay. All right. I'm like, I'm like, God, you're amazing. You like set this conference up with my favorite scripture and I didn't even tell anybody. That stuff fascinates me. It's awesome. So I got put in a boy's home and mom promised I could come home. So I had serious attitude when I was in there for six years. Five and a half years, man. I was very angry. I was very bitter. I grew up in a place called the Masonic Homes, if anybody's ever heard of the Masons. That's where I grew up. That's, I, I grew up there. And they took care of me. But my life was whacked. I started using drugs when I was 12 years old. It didn't matter. I, I was all about me and I had to feel better about me. So I had to use to feel better. So I kept using and using and using and more and more and more and more and more. And anything I could get my hands on to make me lose the reality that I was living in. That's how it happened. And it wasn't just a little bit. It was a lot. It was all the time. I had to stay high. I had to stay stoned. I had to stay drunk because that's the only way that I felt better. So that went on and I was in there for six years. I get kicked out of there and I come home. I get kicked out of my house because my stepdad, the, my, my mother's new husband, tried to be the man and I was the man so he couldn't be the man. So, you know, and I got, all I did was protect and guard and protect and don't diss, don't diss me, don't dishonor me. I mean, that's the way I lived. I lived in a home. We just fought all the time. That was the way it was. So I come home and then he's like, you could never be a real man because real men are Marines. And I said, I'll show you so I joined the Marines with that attitude. <laughs> Not a good idea. So I went in the Marine Corps and I did really good in boot camp. And I went to boot camp for, I think it was like 13 weeks. I was the one that mouthed off the most. So they really broke me down. But then at the end, they, no one could break me, dude, because I was invincible. I was just a, a machine. No Christianity at all in this, in any part of my family. So that's not, there's just none of that stuff, man. My whole life, I saw people that confessed to know God, but I never saw anybody that really knew him. And if people can't see the Christ in you, they don't want what you have, and they don't want your good preach. It's not about just the words that you speak. It's about the life that you lived. See, the Bible says that we're light of the world, that we're salt of the earth. The Bible says that we're light. It doesn't say this little light of mine. It says you're the light of the world. A city on a hill that can't be shaken. You're amazing. There's no basket on your head. I'm serious. When you go to work, if you're the only one that knows you're a Christian, there might be one. If you're the only one that knows you're a Christian at your workplace, something might be twisted. And it's not okay for your workplace to know that you're a Christian when things go bad and you pray in time of need instead of walking as a light because you can be so heavenly minded that you're earthly incredible. So the world wants more of you. So that your boss says, hey, do you know anybody else that's like you? We'd like to have a couple more. I'm serious. Christians are not notorious for that. They're not notorious for the boss saying we need more Christians at our workplace. I'm being serious, but do you know that it's a reality check because we can have that happen? Do you know that it says that darkness and deep darkness shall cover the earth? Do you know that's Isaiah 60 and it's a big deal. It says, but, but, but arise and shine. Dark. Is it getting darker? You know what's awesome? The darker it gets, the brighter we shine. It's time to do this. That was really good. Okay. (laughs) So I joined the Marines. I did real good in boot camp. I came home. My family was like, my stepdad was like, I'm so proud of you. You're a man. And I'm like, thank you. 
And it was weird, I didn't have like this arrogant attitude. I, I was really like silent because I'd mouthed off the whole time in boot camp and it just shuts you down, dude. It's not, anybody a Marine? Anybody, did you mouth off at all in boot camp? I, uh, where'd you go to boot camp at? Did you? Do you know what the quarter deck is? I, I, I had two hours and 46 minutes straight on that. That's serious, man. <laughs> It was the place that you went when you mouthed off and they punished you. <laughs> anyway, it was really bad. So I learned not to mouth off in there. But when I came home for leave, I was like a machine, dude, changed. Everything was like, it was awesome. But it was weird, like they, they puttered me from the outside. It wasn't a transformation from the inside. Are you hearing me? So what happened was, I go home and I'm like, this is awesome. I go back to the fleet. Everything was cool and I started partying again. And within two months, I, I was like, okay, I'm ready to go home. And they're like, sorry, you can't go home. And I said, what do you mean I can't go home? I, I applied for leave. You can't apply for leave for another, I, I think I had like eight months so I could apply. So I just went home anyway. Not a good idea, right? So I went, I went unauthorized absence AWOL. I went home. I stole a couple of guns from my stepdad. He ended up not pressing charges, but I sold him for money, and then I bought drugs, and then I, sold the, and then I ripped off a drug dealer. I took all this money that I had, I took my friends, and we drove across America. Yeah, I lived in Pennsylvania, so I drove out to Colorado. We got jobs as ski bums out there, and I was like, I was running from the Marines. I was like, America's most wanted. I've got all kinds of stuff. I've got warrants out for my arrest, and I'm running, and it's like a pipe dream. So I get arrested. They put me in jail. They told me that I could fight extradition if I wanted to. I tried to. Extradite means take you back across America. So I tried to fight it in the Marines. It didn't work. That happened. I got, I got arrested. I got extradited back, put in the brig. I got out of the brig after a while. They said, you know, we're going to discharge you, but you have like a year till you get out. And I said, okay. So a couple months later, AWOL again. I ran away again. Same place that I ran away to before. So they came out and got me again, extradited me back. Bad conduct discharge, kicked out of the Marines. So I'm not starting off life very well. You see what I'm saying? And it, and it trails you through life. It's a bad deal. So I go home. I get job after job after job after job. And I end up meeting this girl on a blind date one night. And, and it's at a bar. And we meet each other. And, and I tricked her into thinking I was a cool dude. Really? So we ended up, we ended up, we ended up moving in together and ended up a, a year and a half into our relationship, ended up having a child, a daughter, and drug addiction surfaced, and I threatened to kill her if she ever left me. It was a pretty, it was, and it was serious, man. I mean, it happens all the time. It really does. You read about it all the time. You hear about the boyfriend that was raging and killed the, the, the girlfriend and killed himself. That was me, for real. See, I want to start this out this way because you have to understand where my heart is. You have to understand where I'm coming from. Because this gives none of you any excuse. Really. It doesn't matter how hard, how bad, how much, how, how, how horrific your life was. Somebody's always got a worse story. And sometimes we amplify our story over the reality of what the blood has done. And sometimes we share war stories to compare. Oh yeah, well I, oh yeah, well I, oh yeah, well I. And it keeps our mind on things beneath instead of things above. And we never get past who we were to get to who we really are. And I don't care how old you are. If I can, if I can stop a youth, if I can just stop one, one youth, one youth from going through what I had to go through. If I can just stop it, just, just one, it's worth it. You know, I, I think it's great that you guys, that, that it's full and you got a lot. I, I, I would come even if it was five of you. Because if just one person gets it, one person, man, it'll change the world. I mean, how many people did the disciples change? How many people did Paul touch? Come on, man. Let's not boil this thing. Let's, let's, this gospel's amazing. You've got the ability to stomp hell for a living. I mean that. Because that's what we do. But first place, look, the first place that hell needs to be removed is in our thinking. How can you destroy the works of the devil if you still think like him? Do you know that the devil is really depressed? you believe that? Is there any chance of him ever repenting? Do you think he's hopeless? 
Think he's bitter? Yes. Think he's angry? Yes. Think he might be in unforgiveness? Yes. You ever think that way? Yes. This is real simple. The devil is hopeless, bitter, depressed, angry. He's in unforgiveness. There's no chance and there's no way for him to ever make it. And he wants us to think just like him. See, the enemy cannot come up into heaven and kick God off the throne. He tried to rise himself above God and he put him here. But I can promise you this. The enemy is not convinced that he can't dethrone God from the soul of man. The soul is your mind, will, and emotions. He's not after dethroning God, but if he can get you positioned right, and he can get you thinking lies long enough, you'll never see who you are, and you'll live your life from here towards here, not knowing that you're seated with him here, with him here and you live from here towards here. Set your mind on things above. You are seated with Christ in heaven. It doesn't say you will be. It says you are. Yeah. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what the Bible says. It says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It says, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understand what it is. He's given us all these things that we're to do. And all these things that we do are out of all these things that we are. Are you still with me? Okay. So I have this daughter and, and my girlfriend. I'm with her for nine years. I have about 30 jobs. That's how many I counted. In the nine-year period that I'm with her, I quit or got fired from everyone. I never put bread on the table. I always stole from us and I stole from every relative that I had. Even my daughter. Everyone. So everybody, I'm the black sheep, the black cloud, the one that you don't want to leave alone in your house. I'm a freight train for the kingdom of hell. It's constant, it's non-stop, and I am the most horrible person that you probably have ever met. That's who I was pretty bad so I'm with this girl for nine years and then I'm hooked on crack I'm hooked on cocaine it's really really twisted really bad one day I come home after a crack binge and I had threatened to kill her if she ever left or kill myself if she was with somebody I would have I would have done them both and then done myself because that's just a promise that I had in my heart so she left she took my daughter one night and I come home and I'm like you know what I'm done that's it I went over to her stepdad's house because he had a lot of guns. And I went to the, phone, to the gun cabinet and I passed by a phone book and I just flipped it open and it opened to churches. <laughs> Is that weird? I didn't try to open it to churches. I just flipped it open and it broke open to churches and something made me open that book. I know what it was now. It was God because he found me I didn't find him, neither did you. No one comes to God unless he draws you. He'll let you think you found him for a while. But then when you start to read the word, you'll realize, wait a minute, he was seeking you for a long time. Wait a minute, he knew about you before the foundation of the world. Wait a minute, he knit you in your mama's belly. This is crazy. God's that big and that awesome? What? So he'll let you think that. But now it's to know the love of God is to be filled with the fullness of God. And it's amazing because when you know that, your whole life is different. There's nothing, there's nothing the same about you. Your own relatives will say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so I, went to, I, went by the, I was going to the gun cabin. I flipped open a phone book. What I did was I made a check at one of the 586 churches in my hometown. A lot of churches. Made a check and I'm like, you know what? This is crazy. I don't even know why I'm doing this. And I drive to this church, you know, and I don't even remember the whole way there except I was complaining the whole way. So I get to the door downstairs. I went around back, you know. I didn't even go up front. I didn't want to be in the tabernacle or in the, in the, yeah. I was like, I'm hiding, man. I want to go out back. And I'm like, I walk in there and this dude comes up to me and he's like all laughing and happy, 
full of joy. And I said, hey man, I need someone to talk to. He goes, okay, come on buddy, let's go talk. <laughs> and he's all smiles and he's all happy and he's just so thankful. And I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? Because <laughs> I never really met a happy Christian. Seriously, one that was full of joy, full of just bubbling with life. Like one that had rivers flowing out of their belly. One that wasn't pottered by the world. <laughs> Serious, I'm not being mean. I'm telling you, this is what the world sees. There's a reason why people don't bang down the door to get in. Because we've forgotten the go of the gospel. Go is two-thirds of God. We go. What do we go with? Him. Why do we go with Him? Because we've sought Him in the secret. And he rewards us with him in the open. It's awesome. It's relationship. It's covenant. It's one that God would never break. It's awesome, man. He like, he loves us. He's passionately pursuing us. He wants us to know that. He wants us to know that he's pursuing everybody. The same as you. He's like, yeah, you know how I'm pursuing you? I want, I'm pursuing everybody. You know that guy over there that hates everybody around him? That's all tattooed up? That's angry? That's bitter? That's got a gun in his waist? That guy right there, I love him. Go tell him about me. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I can't because, no, 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 no. God says, it's not about you anymore. It's all about me. And because you're all about me, I'm all about you. Now go and tell him how much I love him. <laughs> yeah, but what if he shoots me? Doesn't matter. You're already dead. Now go and tell him about me. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, sounds like Fred Flintstone. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, do. So I go and I'm talking to this guy and I'm like, hey, man, I got to tell you some stuff. He said, go ahead. I'm like, man, my, I've done this and this is what I do right now, man. I just, man, I just did it again. I just went out and smoked crack all night long again, man, again. And I'm angry, and he's just smiling at me, and I'm like, man, I didn't get it. I wasn't, I was angry, but I, it was weird, because normally, honestly, I would want to hit him. Because why would you have the right to be that happy, man? I was really that mad. Why would someone have the right to be that happy, man? It's not a right. It's called righteousness. It's not about rights. See, when you come into the kingdom and you give your life to God, you gave up your rights. You don't have rights. God, by, there's your right, right here. You have the right to manifest him and not you. Mercy woke you up today. Grace filled your lungs today so that you had one more day to manifest him and not you. That's why you're alive. You're alive to manifest him. All creation's groaning. For the sons of God to be made manifest. Creation is groaning for us to manifest him. Really? Sounds weird, huh? It's the truth, man. All creation. Man, I was waiting for somebody to tell me how amazing I was. I'm not saying the stuff I was doing was amazing because that's not true. It doesn't take a man of God to point out the trash in someone's life. It doesn't. The world is really good at that. It takes a man of God to look at somebody and pull the gold out of their life and tell them who they really are so that they have hope because we're supposed to be ambassadors of hope. People want a reason to live and dying to yourself is the best reason to live. It really is. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. Because I love you. I really do. You can be as mad as you want at me and I just love you. Watch, here's the key. You don't have to love me back for me to feel okay about telling you I love you first. It's true. God does not need you to tell him you love him for him to feel secure about him telling you first. Because he is love. And he created us in his image. We're taught, I love you, do you love me? We're taught that. I love you, come on, say it. We're taught, it's selfish. If I tell you I love you and I need you to say it back, I only said it for me. Think what you want. It's true. If I'm at work and I'm sweeping the floor because I want you to see me, 
I'm not doing my job as under the Lord. I'm doing it to gain favor with man. I need you to appreciate me. You will live your life governed by the fear of man. You will live your life manipulated by what people think about you and what they don't think about you. But if you live your life in a way to honor God and not man, seek honor to give God glory, to give him honor. See, when people come up to me, oh, Todd White, oh, Todd White, I get it. I get it. But the reality of it is, is I always smell like sheep. I love people. I don't like, I don't hide from people. I love people. I love people. My, my Jesus, he loved people. He came across, he came across the lake, he came across the seas, and, and, and he comes across and he's going to hang out with his disciples. He's like, let's go chill. He sees all these people and he's moved with compassion. That's my Jesus. He's, he's moved, he loves people, he wants to be around people, he wants to give them. God so loved the world that he gave. And God created us in that image to show love that we give. And we don't give out of servanthood. We give out of friends with God. A servant, but also a friend. It's different. You can live your life in servanthood and you can serve God. Or you can live your life and, as a friend and serve out of friendship. It'll change your life. The one way will wear you out. Because you're doing things for God. Serving as a friend of God. It can't wear you out because all you're doing is giving him away. There's a lot in that. You will be trapped in performance and trapped in trying to do things to please God, not realizing that you're already pleasing because you believe. Are you with me still? Kinda. I know, I look out there and it's like, (laughs) this is good, it's good gospel stuff. So good. And I've got a whole bunch of sessions with you, so we just got so much good stuff. It would be awesome. Okay. Sorry. So I'm talking to this guy, and he doesn't say, hey, Todd, you, you, you need to pray this prayer. Which is really good. I am all about populating heaven and depopulating hell. But I'm not about just praying a prayer to get to heaven. Jesus never told you to do that. He never said pray a prayer so that you get to heaven one day. He said give him your life so that heaven can get into you. It's different. If I pray a prayer to get to heaven, yes, it's true. Heaven is my destination too. But if you pray a prayer to get to heaven, heaven's your mission too. Which means you position yourself in a church to pray for Jesus' return because life is bad and you can't handle it much longer. And you're taught that Jesus is coming soon. And when you talk to people, you say, hey, he's coming soon, brother. And you get your perspective on an eschatology, theology, instead of a supernatural kingdom that you're supposed to bring and give. Listen, I, I want to I explain to you this. It's so powerful. If I pray a prayer just to get to heaven one day, and all I know is that one day I'm getting to heaven, I will live like hell till I get there. But if I give Jesus my life, take upon me his yoke, it's easy, and his burden is light, and then I will have rest. And when I do that, I position myself in a church to be fed, but not only in church, I be fed all the time, because I'm growing in relationship with my Father. And I realize that I don't have to read the Bible in the Jesus is coming back theology soon, because when I say Jesus is coming soon, my prayers are all geared towards get me out of here, God. Things are bad. My job is hard. My family, they don't understand. Everything is gone. My rent is really hard to pay. My car payments, God, they're going to repossess my house. I can't believe this. Jesus, come and get me out of here to heaven with me and to hell with the world. Think with me. When you position yourself to pray for his return, and that becomes your number one priority, It's to heaven with me and to hell with everybody else. That's not being mean. That's being real. Are you guys okay? That one doesn't go over very well for everybody. I'm not being mean. I'm being real. It's not about 
I am totally thankful, and I know that Jesus is coming. I get it. I understand that. The day that he was crucified, it was set into motion. When he was resurrected, it's on. Right? But he didn't pay a price for us to just get there. He paid a price for us to bring it here. So that my mission is 1 John 3, 8, to destroy the works of the devil. And my destination is one day to stand before him and him say, well done. Uh, I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say that to me. You know, it's weird because it's like, it's like the Olympic training. They train for the Olympics, right? You know, and it's like they train for, for eight years, for eight hours a day, full force, man. And they train for all that time. And it's everything they put into this one 30 second race. It's just like Christianity. Your whole life, you train, you, you, you live and you walk out kingdom for that one 10 second, however long it takes. Well done. so powerful it's worth it it's worth it you give up your life don't seek to save it or you lose it you deny yourself you pick up your cross you follow him you take upon you his yoke it's easy because your burden is heavy you cannot do it you cannot labor that thing you will be worn out you will be worried freaked out you will be bitter, angry, and you will always have something to say about people. It will always be about they did this or they did that. They hurt me. What would it be like to be an unoffended people group? I have lived my life for seven and a half years as a Christian and never been offended at somebody. That's amazing. I've never copped an attitude. I love people. We can do this. This is who God says we are. I'm not up here trying to, I want you to just be wrecked. I want God to wipe you out in such a way where you're no good for nothing else. But him and loving people and your job, you're amazing at it because you're no longer working for the man, you're working for the man. And since you're right with God, you're a believer, everything gets transformed. Everywhere you go, you are a light, you are a beacon of light. You are amazing. And people look at you and say, dude, what's wrong with you? And you could say, you know what? It's not what's wrong. It's what, what's been made right. See, I was, I was separated from God. And now I'm not. I was an enemy of God. And now I'm not. What are you talking about? God. Yeah, he lives in me. Look in there. Yeah. I'm so serious. You don't know how many times I've done that. I've done that thousands of times. On airplanes, I'm sitting there talking to somebody, and there I'm like, hey, how you doing, man? All right, what's going on? Man, wow, you're really happy. Yeah, man, it's this, it's this name. It's Jesus. And I tell them my testimony, you know, shorter than what I'm telling you, but same thing, shorter. And I'm like, yeah, and I, I, I get to love people for a living, man, and I just love you. And they're like, okay, dude, whoa. And by the end of the plane ride, they're undone. Why? Because you can't resist the love of God. God's love is so good and so amazing. When you see it, you can no longer live the way that you ever lived. You, you have to live your life in such a way in awe and in reverence of a king. Everybody wants a king like Jesus. Everybody. See, the Bible says that God is love. Why would you, and God, the Bible says that God's our father. Why would you not want to be fathered by love? Oh my gosh. It's because the world doesn't understand love. The world understands selfish love. Love with ulterior motives. You know, I'm, I'm in the parking lot yeah, today, I think, before we drove up here. I was in another city and I walked out of Costco and I saw some kids that were sitting on a car. And I walked in and I thought, I want to go bless them kids. And I'm like, wait a minute, they're young kids. I, I, I need to find the parents. I don't know where the parents are. And I go into this big Costco, which is a big old store. Uh, you know, and I'm walking through. I'm not even looking for the parents. But it's on my heart to bless that family. 
So I walk out, and here's the parents just coming out, same time, sitting at the car. I walked by, and I reached in, and I grabbed uh, all the cash I had on me, and I just said, hey, here, man, I just want to tell you something. He's like, what are you doing? I said, man, God loves you so much, man. You're amazing. I just want to tell you that. You're amazing. He's like, why? Why would you, God, why? I said, because you just are. You don't got to do anything. No, God did it all so you can know how amazing you are. You're incredible. And he's like, are you serious, man? I'm so, so serious, man. I don't want nothing from you. There's no strings. I don't even know you. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm not even from, I'm in California. And God would speak to my heart about you and, and send me here just to tell you this. You're really important, man. Amazing. And you're a great dad. What? I said, you really are, man. I just thank you for letting me bless you. He doesn't even know what to say. And I don't need him to say anything. I don't need him to say thank you. Because I didn't do it for a thank you. I really didn't. I, I mean, I have this, I just have this belief system. That I don't have to do things for people to get thanked. I, I don't need their th It's great that people do it out of, out of you know, courteous and, and all that. I get it, manners and thank you. Someone does something, and that's great. But I don't need it to feel good about doing it. This is amazing stuff. This is amazing revelation. Jesus paid a price for us to be selfless. It's not hard. All you got to do is give up. Really? I call it being born again again. Because you give your life to Jesus and then you only give what you know that you can't, what you, what you did. And then all of a sudden you make a mess is in your life and you're like, this is not fun. If the gospel is not fun that you're believing, you're believing the wrong one. Because the gospel, the gospel means good news. That, that's good. That's not a bummer news. That's not wo woe is me news. That's good news. It's amazing. It's called grace. It's awesome. We get to be like Jesus, man. That's not blasphemy. That's the Bible. It says follow him. It says anybody that says that they abide in me. In 1 John, it says they ought walk just as he walked. How do you get out of that one? If we say we abide in him, you can walk just like he walked. Well, how did he walk? Fully surrendered, never taking glory to himself, always bringing glory to God. Never seeking honor from people, but always honoring people. Laying down his life. Greater love hath no one than this, laying down his life. He's on a cross, spit on, ripped out beard, slashed and trashed to no end, mutilated beyond anything before. And he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And that's the God that we serve. And that's the one that created us in his image to walk just like he walked. It's not too far out there. And I'm not out of my mind. I'm out of yours. But I'm being real. This is real. This is real. We can do this. Because we are this. Are you okay? Okay. It's going to get more intense, man. I'm just telling you. And I just want to tell you before I go on that I really love you. I just do, but I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to bring it. I have to, because I'm not here. I'm not here for me. I'm here for him, and I love you, and it's amazing. And if God can use me, he can use any of you. I'm having trouble holding it together right now, because he really, really, really loves us. It's so good. I spent most of my life crying anymore. My eyes are always swollen and red. People are like, are you tired? No, I've been crying all day. <laughs> it's crazy. Because he really loves us that much. He's so good. He's good. And his mercy endures forever. <sighs> Jesus. So this guy, this Dan, says to me, he says, hey, I said, man, I don't, I, I don't get why you're so happy. This is freaking me out. I didn't say it like that. I said bad words. I just did. And he, no, he didn't even flinch. Sometimes we think that like, like someone cusses or swears or does something that doesn't know God. Sometimes we think that God's in heaven going, son, 
Cover your ears. And we get offended in our heart and get upset. Well, they need to change the way they talk. We think we can squeeze them from the outside to make them change what comes out. All they need is a new heart that doesn't have that stuff in it to say. But how are they ever going to have that if we keep responding like hell to them? No one ever got changed from the outside in. And if you did, it's short-lived. That's what AA does. Gives you 12 steps to change you from the outside in. And it works psychologically to try to make you... But you know what? You confess you're an alcoholic for the rest of your life. What do you do? You fight alcohol. Did you hear that? If I say, hey, my name's Todd. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hi, Todd. What am I? An alcoholic. What do I do? I fight alcohol. I'm not making light of it. I'm making the most of Jesus, man. Because the gospel is a one-step program, not 12. We can't, 12 steps are way too long. And, and you can make yourself your own higher power. That's not good. That's what got you there. You got to pick a higher power. They tell you, first step, pick a higher power. Okay, I pick me. Not a good answer. I'm being serious, right? How about, hi, my name's Todd and I'm a new creation. Hi, Todd. Wait a minute, that's not part of the program. I know, but it's the only one that really works, man. Do you know that if I teach you that you're a sinner, you'll sin by faith? Do you know that the fivefold the fivefold gift, apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists. Do you know it's not to equip the sinners for the work of ministry? I'm not saying we never miss it. I'm saying we need to think about us like God thinks about us. If you're taught you're a sinner, what do you do? You sin. If you're taught you're a saint, what do you do? Think about this. Paul said to the saints who are in Ephesus. He didn't say in heaven. It's a different way of thinking. I've been sun conscious since I've been born again. Not sin. It's really possible. I promise it is. When I start sharing like this, people are like, oh boy. <laughs> That'll that'll keep you so pinned to the ground you will think you're a worm in the dirt when Satan's cursed to crawl on his belly not you that'll make you worthless forever when he's the only one that's worth nothing he's a withering branch as we speak he's severed from the source of life there's no chance for him the only one worthless is the devil and all of his fallen ones and you have nothing to do with them nor they with you so stop thinking like them So he tells me, he says, I, I said, man, I, I go, anything's better than what I'm doing now. He goes, well, good. He didn't say, invite Jesus into your heart. You know what he said? You need to give Jesus your life, man. You need to give up and give God your life. Just give him your life, man. I said, what does that even look like? He said, well, he says, you just say, I give up. <laughs> and I said, what does that even look like? He said, you won't, you can't see that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Jesus said he wants to give us peace. And the peace that he has to give us is not like the world. But he wants to give us peace that surpasses our understanding. So if you think you have to understand it, you'll never have it. Because he wants to give us peace that surpasses our understanding. You submit to God, and out of your submission to God, the devil's resisted. It's not two steps. Submit, then resist. It's submit, and out of submission. Submission doesn't mean, 
I surrender 70% and hold on to 30. Your 30 will become 35, 35, 40, 45, 50, and all of a sudden you're a 50, 50 Christian, half in, half out, straddling a fence that's imaginary. It's about all. Oh. So he said, you just need to, you just need to give to you. So I said, I, I just, how do I do it? He said, just tell him you give him your life. I said, oh God, I just give you my life. I don't even know what it looks like. And he said, I don't have to know. But I'm sick of me. <laughs> and I, and this, this, this sensation. I'm not a big feeling guy. I just don't. I, I don't live by feelings, man. It's deception. You live by feelings, you're done. You live when you walk by faith, not by feelings. Not about how you feel. Are you with me? So, but I didn't want to kill myself. Like right then, I didn't want to kill myself. It was so weird. Like I was suicidal when I went in there. And, and now I'm like, I don't want to kill myself. And I'm like, I went, I, I said, now what? He goes, here's my number. I need you to call me. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? He said, well, you need to get baptized. Awesome. So I did. So I go, and I go home, and I call my, my girlfriend. And I said, hey, I said, honey, you need to tell mommy that daddy found God. And she said, what's he like? See, this, this daughter is seven and a half years old and has no idea who God is. She has no idea what a dad is. All she knows is that I'm her dad, that's all she knows, and it was messed up. And so mom comes home, and she hates me, man. I mean, hates me. Like, hates me. I ruined our lives. She goes, you hypocrite. Now you're going to bring God into this? There is no God. Who do you think you are? And you're going to put your daughter through this stuff? And it was really bad, really ugly. And my daughter's like, Daddy, I'm so glad we're home. You know, she's just tossed to and fro. So that first night, I'm out smoking crack. First night, really. And, and this time, my conscience was violated. I'm like, I didn't want to do this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. It's killing me. And then the next night, again, again, again. For five and a half months, I'm going to church on Sunday, and I'm calling every day. I did it again, man. I'm calling Dan. I did it again. He would never, ever talk about my problem. He would always talk about who I am. He never said, well, the reason why you're doing this is because this is in your life and this is who you used to be and so it's making you do this now. He never said any of that stuff, man. You know what he said? This is who you really are. This is what God says. Let me tell you what God says about you. Yeah, what, what is that doing for me, man? I mean, look, I'm doing it again. I, I understand. Well, this is also what he says. And he just kept on hitting me, and he never pitied me, but he had compassion on me. And he brought the truth, the reality of who I was. So for five and a half months, man, I am twisted and destroying everyone's life. Everyone. I've got this band, right? And I am jamming in this band. I've got a rock band, and it's like really heavy music, really like aggressive music. So I've got all this band, and, and that day that I... That I that I went home and, and told my girlfriend. That day, I, I, I'm like, I called my best friend, who's a guitar player, just amazing. I said, dude, I found Jesus. He's like, he's like, dude, there's no Jesus, man. I said, no, I'm serious, man. I'm so serious, dude. He's like, okay, right. So they come next, the, the, two nights later for band practice. All the guys come, they're in my house, in my basement. And I'm like, guys, it's awesome. I found Jesus, man. They're like, easy. It's not going over well at all. And they are mad at me for talking about it. Everybody but my friend Bobby. But everybody else is like, like, dude, you're a freak. Knock it off. And I'm like, give me a hit, dude. I'm partying with them. I'm drinking with them. And I'm telling them about Jesus. And it's really bad. Really bad. So this goes on. Two practices. The second practice, the guys didn't show up. They took their stuff and they bailed. Only one guy stayed. He's my guitar player. He's my best friend. And he's like, dude... I don't believe in this Jesus, but hey, man, I believe in you. And I said, man, I'm telling you, he's real, man. Come on, dude, let's party. And then to top it off, I'd be coming downstairs after raging on my family upstairs, screaming and punching holes in doors and freaking out. And I'd come in, and I'd be so angry. And I'm like, okay, Jesus. I'm serious. I'd come into the basement. I'd say, hey, man, Jesus thinks you're amazing, dude. I didn't say amazing. 
But I just told him, Jesus loves you, man. It's serious, man. He's real. Come on, man. Let's party. So for five and a half months, that stuff's going on. Twisted. Twice a week, this guy is my best friend. Anybody got any best friends? Yeah. Right? Anybody got a best friend that doesn't believe? Yeah. You should have yeah. friends that don't believe. Yeah. That you can make believers because of your life lived, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because if we only associate with Christians, we're in trouble. Somebody on your job ought to be your friend that's not saved that will be because of your life lived. People will come to know God because of your life lived. Because you know God, they come to know God because you know Him. Okay, so, does that make sense? Live in such a way that, that people that don't know God come to know God because of your relationship with God. Because it's attractive and special and beautiful. So, I go through this thing, man, for five and a half months, and it's just messed up, and, and, and Jackie is just hating my guts, man, and she is ready to just leave, and it's just really bad. So five and a half months into it, I go out, and I'm in a crack, in a crack deal. I pick up this kid. I get these drugs in my hand. I tell this kid that I'm a cop, and this is a thug. This is a kid from New York City. He's not from a small town. He's from the big city. New York's a big city. So I got him, I got the drugs, and I said, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I read him his rights, and I got this guy. And he's like, he's freaking out. I knew you were a cop. I knew it. And I'm like, I got him. I have a big amount of drugs and of crack in my hand. So I said, step out of the car, put your hands on the hood. And when he stepped out of the car, I hit the gas. And he unloaded a 9 millimeter at me from 10 feet away. Yes, he did. <laughs> And a voice filled my vehicle and said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? See, when you see me up here, you see the passion that I have and the compassion. See, this is real. See, when I tell you that, I can remember the blast coming out of the end of the gun. And I can remember the voice coming forth in my vehicle. Whether it was audible or not, I heard it and it wouldn't go away. And I went, and you know what I did? I went and did the drugs anyway. Why? Because I was whacked. Out bad. See, everybody's got a bad story. So I go and I do the drugs. I can't get high all night long. All the voice just keeps coming back again, 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 again. I took those bullets for you. I took those bullets for you. Are you going to live for me? Then I get, I pull over on the side road, and I get a flashlight and look around. There's no bullet holes in any of my vehicle. Not one. That's just, that's crazy, man. And I can't get high, and it's overwhelming, because God's goodness is overwhelming me. And I go home that night, and my girlfriend's up. I hate you. And I left. And three days later, I went to a place called Teen Challenge. So I, are you okay with me telling you my testimony? This is powerful stuff. I mean, I'm teaching in the midst of it, and, and, but it's important that we understand that it doesn't matter what you've been through. It matters what he went through. Because anybody, 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 whosoever, whosoever believeth should not perish. Whosoever. That's a big word, man. Let's not like theologically explain the predestination thing above the whosoever. That's important. So I, I go to Team Challenge, and, and my girlfriend is glad to get rid of me. She is angry. But right before I left, I called, I, at that morning, I called after I came home from, and, and left. I called Bobby, my best buddy, my best friend, the guitar player. And I told him, I said, dude, I said, man, I said, last night, man, I was out. I was out on this, like, on this crack bench. I picked up this kid, man, and, and I told him I was a cop, man. He shot at me. He goes, oh, man, he missed you? I said, dude, I'm here. I said, but, but it's different, man. I, I couldn't get high. Oh, it wasn't real. The drugs weren't real. I said, no, no, no. This voice spoke to me. I said, I took those bullets for you. He goes, he didn't use real bullets, man. Come on, dude. And he's trying to psychologically analyze and explain to me. I'm like, listen, man. Jesus is real. This is real. Something happened. I made the decision. I'm going to be going away in three days, man. They accepted me. They, they rushed my thing. I've got a bed opening up at, at Team Challenge. I got to go. Oh, you're going to rehab? I said, yeah, man, but it's not like a regular rehab, dude. Listen, 
Jackie left me. She doesn't want anything to do with me. She hates me. I'm not a father to destiny. You've seen my life, man. It's messed up. He goes, yeah. He goes, but man, you can do this, man. You don't need to go away. Dude, you can do this. And I said, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. I said, I got to go. So I said, is there any way we can hang out? Because he was a stay-at-home dad. You know, he had two kids, but they, they had all their bills paid. He had received a settlement and, and only had an electric bill, phone bill, like no bills, and the wife wanted to work. And so he had a three-and-a-half-year-old, uh, yeah, a three-and-a-half-year-old and a seven-and-a-half-year-old, same age as my daughter, her, his son was. So as these two kids, I'm like, dude, I, I, I need you to meet me, man, so I can see you, because they're not going to let me see you for a year. Because when you go in Teen Challenge, it's a year. And I said, I can't see you. And he's like, dude, he goes, there's no way, man. You're leaving in three days, but look, I, we got stuff planned. We're going different places. There's no way to do it, man. He goes, man. I said, I got to go. He goes, man, Jesus isn't real. You don't got to go away for a year. I said, I do, man. I'm doing it. I already, I already told my daughter I'm leaving. He's like, man. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. He goes, I'll, I'll be here when you get back, man. We'll, we'll jam, dude. I love you. You're my friend. I believe in you, man. I said, dude, I'm the one that's doing this stuff. He said, you just don't understand. You'll see. So I'm like, oh, okay, man. So I call him on the way up three days later. I'm on my way up Teen Challenge. He doesn't answer the phone. I leave a message. I really, he's my best friend, man. I want to talk to him, you know? <clears throat> so I get up there and I submit myself. My daughter's sad. I go in there and it's, anybody ever went through Teen Challenge? No? Okay. It's like a boot camp, pretty much. Spiritual boot camp. It's pretty intense. You have to really submit. Lots of people quit, leave, all that stuff. It's a big deal. So I submitted to, to a teen challenge, and three days later, I get this call, and it's Dan, and he calls, and the counselor's in the office, and he says, uh, Todd, you need to come in here. And I heard it, and in the tone of his voice, I knew it wasn't good. And so I am in a place of worry and freaked outness, and I am just flipping out because I'm thinking, Something happened to Jackie, which is my girlfriend. Something happened to Destiny, which is my daughter. It's not good. He's got this somber face, and it's not okay. And I said, what's going on, man? He goes, let's sit down, man. You need to talk to your pastor. I'm like, oh. He goes, he said, just sit down. Just calm down. I'm going to leave the room. I need you to talk to your pastor. So I sit down, and Dan's like, Todd, I need to talk to you. And I said, what? <clears throat> he says, it's Bobby. I said, what? Bobby's my best friend. He's the only one that stuck with me. He's my, he's like the only one. Like when everybody is like, you're crazy. He's like, from the world standpoint, I'm here for you, man. I'm with you. He said, it's Bobby. I said, what? He goes, Bobby had a brain aneurysm. My best friend in the world that doesn't believe in Jesus had a, had a brain aneurysm. That rocked me. And I freaked out. See, <clears throat> he's the only one that stuck with me. Am I allowed to come down here? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. yeah? Can I? Oh. It's powerful. Oh, I feel so much better down here. <laughs> Usually I'm down here right away. But for some reason, I thought that I had to be up there. Thank you. <clears throat> so my best friend is in a coma and had a brain aneurysm, and the doctors don't expect him to live through the night. And I'm like, this is not happening. And I'm only three days in Teen Challenge, and I start to freak out. And I, I, I threw the phone down. I ran out of the office, and I'm like, no! No! Anybody got any best friends in here that aren't saved? Anybody got any good friends that aren't saved? That's a big deal, man. Anybody got any family that's not saved? It's not your talk that's going to change them. See, I'm... I'm aware right now of the tragedy of not walking. And I ran upstairs into the prayer room, and I, I ran upstairs. I go to this prayer room. I open the door. I go inside, and the door doesn't shut behind me because someone's in there with me. It's a dude 
that I ran into in Teen Challenge that is constantly in my face. His name's Micah. And I don't get along with him. And in normal circumstances, I would have hit him already. But I walk into the prayer room and he follows me up. He doesn't, he doesn't leave me alone. See, I need to be alone right now, see? Because this is not good and I need to be alone. I am really angry and the best friend of my whole life is, is in a coma. I go in there and Micah comes in and he goes, I said, dude, leave me alone. He comes up and he gets in my face and he says, dude, it's not that bad. And I freak out and I scream, no! And peace entered the prayer room and knocked me to the ground and knocked Micah into the couch. <laughs> I've never had peace before in my life, see? Ever, ever, not one time. Never. And peace that surpassed, it, surpassed my understanding had just entered the room. And it hit me. And I cried. And I said, no. And I said, no. And God spoke to me and said, you're not going anywhere. And I said, I got to. And it was like, what are you going to do when you do? What are you really going to do when you leave? What are you going to do? And I'm like, I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. So Micah and I became best friends. <laughs> totally supernatural, man. For real. <clears throat> so I, I stay at Teen Challenge, and I, and I have an encounter one day, two months into the program. I'm across the street. I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting by the Susquehanna River, right across the street, sitting on a bench. And I'm just sitting there, and I have a guitar, and I'm just strumming the strings. And it's not my guitar. It's someone else's, but they're letting me do it. And I love the way the strings, I don't know where to put my fingers, but I love the way the strings sound. And this homeless guy comes up, and he's pushing a shopping cart down this path that's straight. The street is like a, a mile long. It's a straightaway. He's pushing the shopping cart. He's got sneakers on. He's got swim goggles on his head, a baseball cap on, a scruffy beard. He's got army fatigues, and they're, they're like cut off, like not cut off, but they're floods. He's pushing the shopping cart. And I said, hey, man, I just want to tell you, Jesus loves you, man. And he pushes his cart off the trail. And he comes up to me and he goes, I know how much he loves me, but do you know how much he loves you? The homeless guy. And I'm like, tell me. And he looks at me and he looks at my friend. And he goes, you have demons in you. The homeless guy did. He doesn't know why I'm there. He doesn't know I'm at Teen Challenge. He has no idea. He looks at me and he tells me this stuff. And <clears throat> my friend freaked out and he went across the street. And this guy sat there and talked to me about righteousness. About Jesus and about who I am. And it sounded just like that guy Dan. But it was more intense and it was more calculated. Something was going on. He looks at me and he said, I'm praying for you and this thing's leaving you. So I'm like, he doesn't even know what, he has no idea. So he prays for me. I don't feel anything. You know, I don't feel this big like, <sniffs> nothing. I go across the street, I turn around and he's gone. And it's a straight street, there's nowhere for him to go, but he's not there anymore. Which is crazy. I've gotten two emails since then of the same guy cited by different people that are free. Same guy. That's crazy, man. It's nuts. So I go in, and, and the guys are making fun of me. I have these dreams. I have been having these nightmares every night. I'm getting attacked in my dreams, and it's horrible. Every night. So I have this dream where I'm in this valley in my dream. And in the valley, there's these steep sides. And in my normal dreams, I'm attacked, and I have to run and hide, and I duck underneath stuff and duck underneath dumpsters or whatever, because like, I'm in a city in most of my dreams. And this time, it starts to shake, and I hear this voice, and it says, Do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I have no idea, dude. It's the first time that I didn't have a monster chasing me down in my dream. Seriously. And I woke up. And I went down to the prayer room. The one that I said that I ran up to that day. Because every morning in Teen Challenge, I would wake up an hour before everybody else woke up. So I could seek God without anybody looking. Seriously. So before anything started, I'm going to seek him. And I couldn't read. I had ADHD. I could never read. My whole life, I couldn't read. Never read a book before in my whole life. The Bible is the first book I can get. Really, it's awesome, because it's not meant for your brain, it's meant for your heart. 
So I, so I, I open it up, I just flip it open by chance, and it opens to, to, to the 23rd Psalm. And it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And I'm like, that was God. I didn't tell anybody. I went through my day, didn't say anything to anybody. Something was different. Something was happening. Like, something, like I'm reading and, and something's opened. Like, I, I can see. It's weird. It's that eyes to see thing, ears to hear thing. Something's going on. I, I just, I sense that my heart's different. So, second night, same dream, same valley. Crazy. I wake up, same exact time, without my alarm clock, wake up at the exact same time, go down there, flip it open, 23rd Psalm, again, same thing. Third night, same dream, except this time a light shined down the valley behind me, and I said, his hand touched my shoulder and said, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, go home. Now, I'm only two months into the program, and he told me to go home. That doesn't work out well with people because you committed to a year and in all actuality, you're a quitter. You're quitting and most people that leave early do not fare well. Seriously, you're under a spiritual umbrella so it's a big time attack. So I, I go downstairs and I, first I pack my stuff in the bag, in my trash bags. I go downstairs my stuff and they're freaking out. I call Dan, they're like, you ain't doing this. What are you doing? How can you leave? You're going to be smoking crack in two weeks. You're going to be dead. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. But it couldn't hurt me. It was so weird. I was like free from me. Like, it's not the program that changes you. It's Christ through the program that changes you. It's always Jesus Christ. It's never your program. But the program's awesome. But you can go through the program, not submit to God, and not be changed. You can be made to do something, but when you say, that's it, it's on. See, what we don't get is people's lives are at stake, man. People are dying every day. And they need a reason to live, and you're their reason to live. It's true. So I, Dan comes up, and he picks me up. And he goes into the office, and they are screaming. And Dan's in there. And I have to wait outside. They won't let me permeate the bunch, because... All that stuff. So I'm out in the porch, but I'm free. I'm like free, dude. It's, it's crazy. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I'm like, oh. I'm, I have this joy that no one can take. See, watch. If I'm accepted by God, you can't reject me. I'm accepted by God. Your acceptance is not what accepted me. So how could your resistance reject me you didn't give me my acceptance you can't take it from me that's awesome to really help you be able to talk to people well they rejected me get over that you're accepted how can you be accepted and rejected you're either accepted or you're not and if you are so what serious this is a real simple thing so he takes me home and he tells me all the reasons why I'm going to make it the whole way home. And I'm like, man, thanks, man. And he, I said, you know, my heart, my heart is like, I said, what's going on with Jackie? How's Jackie? He said, Todd, she came to Jesus. My girlfriend came to God. I'm like, are you kidding? Really? Yeah, she, she came. To I said, I can't move, I can't move back home. Because see, we're not married. And this is crazy. See, I got a revelation that I can't live with her. I just can't. My heart, my heart, my conscience is clean. See, my conscience is clean. So I can't violate my conscience. It's all we got, man. Really, the blood cleanses your conscience from dead works in order to serve God. It's amazing. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. So I, I, I went and I had him take me to the house. And I, I just came to the house and my daughter came out and said, Daddy, she came and hugged me and jumped on me. I get to love my daughter. It's awesome. I'm like, I'm free. It's awesome. And she goes, Daddy, come in. I said, I can't. She goes, why, Daddy? Yes, you can. This is where you live. I said, no, I can't live here. Daddy, no. Why? You're my daddy. She said, because your daddy's a man of God. What's that have to do with you living here, Daddy? I'm serious. I said, 
I'm a man of God, and I can't do that to God or your mommy. And she said, well, I don't understand. She cried, and, and mom's there, Jackie. And I said, hey, you. She goes, hey. I said, I really love you. She said, I do love you too. I said, this is really awkward. <laughs> you see? See, people see my videos or see my stuff, and, and they don't know my heart. You don't, you don't know me. I live this thing, man. I don't, I don't play with stuff. I don't compromise. I live this thing. You're not going to read about me in the paper. I'm a man of God all the way through. I live this thing. I live this thing. There are people's lives that are at stake. We can all do this because we have to be this. We can all, we all got the ability to change the lives of people around us. And the biggest way it changes is by watching your life that's completely radically different than anything they've ever seen. So amazing that they want to be like you. They want to be around you and they're freaked out by you. <laughs> and my, my girlfriend looks at me and she goes, she goes, well, let's get married. I go, that's a good idea. <laughs> really. See, this testimony never gets old. It really doesn't, because it's my life. It's, it's where everything is. It's, it's everything. Your life is a testimony. Your life is a testimony that has the ability of doing the same thing in others' lives around you. <laughs> For real? Freedom, man. Promise. You hear me? <laughs> I love you, man. I'm serious. Can I just give you a hug, dude? Because I really want to. Come on, man. I love you, man. So proud of you. Love you, man. Dude. So good. I promise. Never the same. No joke. Oh, God. This is really good. Yeah, I promise, man. I promise. You hear me? <laughs> oh. I know what I hear in my heart, man. I'm going to pray for you, dude. You're going to let me too, right? You ain't getting out of this. I love you, man. Okay? After we're done, I'll go pray for you. Don't run. I need to get you. I love you, man. I'm proud of you. I have no idea, man. I want to say a lot of things, but I won't because God's not letting me, but I promise you. You hear me? Promise. For real, man. <laughs> I know what I hear in my heart. I don't know nothing but what he's telling me. And it's really good. <laughs> really good. Oh my gosh, dude. Oh! I can't. I gotta pray for you right now, dude. Just hold on. I just got, is it okay? I got you, man. Because I, I see 15 years of horrible, horrible stuff, man. Just bang, being yanked, man. Right now, dude. I promise you. Okay, oh, it's good. Put your hands on your daddy. This is really good. Jesus, come on, Holy Spirit. Jesus' name. God, I'm asking you to impart my life and everything that you've given me to this man. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. This is really good news, man. Really good news. I am so proud of you. Thanks, man, for coming. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for not saying no. Thanks for coming. Promise you, dude, life is going to be radically wrecked. Jesus, come on, Holy Ghost. Do what you do. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, God. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for your overwhelming love, your overwhelming compassion. God's going to be a father that you've never even seen. A father like you've never known. It's going to be so good starting now. Jesus. Jesus. God, thank you for brand new insides in Jesus' name. Brand new insides, God. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. You feel that hot? You feel that hot? That's really good. Jesus. 
Jesus. Oh God, you are gonna, your whole family is gonna be wrecked, dude. I'm not kidding, dude. All people that have said this and that are gonna be completely weirded out and freaked out by your life. And you're just not, you've been bold in your life. This boldness is something that comes from God. You'll be bold and you will stand in such a way. See, you're already willing to take a bullet for the gospel. It just doesn't matter because you just got it going on. Jesus' name. Radical. Ah. Ah. Oh. oh my God. I got to get through the rest of this testimony. Sorry. Not really. Oh my gosh. Oh, dude. You are going to, listen, I'm going to say this congregationally. You are not getting out of this. Oh, it's so good. Dude. Yeah. This is, I'm messed up right now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't explain to you what I'm feeling right now, but it's really good. Stop. Okay. It's exciting. How exciting is to see lives changed. It's really exciting. You get the ability to change people's lives. This is awesome. See, there's a reason why I'm going through all this stuff, man. I see it. When I look in the eyes of people, I see where they're at, man. I see them. And I know freedom. <laughs> I just want to go out and start laying hands on people that I see. Because I know it's good. It is. You're like, this guy's whacked. You're right. I just thought, good. Good. My dad's amazing, man. Oh my gosh. I'm lost. I need the keys or something. Someone play something. Come play. Come play the keyboard. Just play. Help. It helps it go down easier. Help. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, I just like see such integrity on you, man. Just such wholehearted love for God, dude. You're playing up there and I'm seeing the heart of God. I'm seeing like a David, man. You just got a heart that's after God. You're, you're, you're after God's heart, man. Nothing takes you away from that. Nothing pulls you away from that. When you worship, you're worshiping God with everything you are. There's nothing in you holding back. You just, you got it all, dude. You, you got it all surrendered before God. You've got a fleece out before God. Every day, your life is a fleece, man. You're just like, here I am, God. Here it is. It's you, man. Play, man. Please. Please play. <laughs> Pray so I can finish this. Pastor, just keep me in prayer right now because I want to finish this. I'm really lost right now, dude. <laughs> I don't feel really. Because I know people that the same things happen to. One of them's here right now. They're free because of this thing. Free! Free, like no like process, just free. The process is too hard. It's the submission, it's the one step, it's not 12. 12 doesn't work. One step, bang, submit, bang, it's God. Just let him love you, man. Why would you resist his love? He's so good, it's amazing. So I, so, so Jackie and I, on Sunday morning, I didn't move in, but on Sunday morning, four days later, in between first and second service. How long do you got in between your first and second service? 15 minutes. That's when we got married. We just got married right in between this. It didn't matter. Why? Because it wasn't about our big wedding. It was about our covenant before God. It wasn't about going into debt for $20,000 so I could have a beautiful wedding. It was about I am making a covenant that God paid a price for me to enter into so that I could just be one with my wife and we could have covenant together. So we just got married and no one understood, but my wife did. It's powerful, so powerful. I want to read you, 
I'm going to read you a set of scriptures. <laughs> Jesus, help. I just want to read this to you. Matthew 5, verse 14. Okay. Come, come on. Just give me a hug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're making it hard for me. Sorry, I came to make it easier. It's good, it's good. Okay, I'm gonna to tell. make you feel better. I feel really good, let me tell you. Okay. The rest of the story. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's good, thank you so much. See the heart on her, that heart is amazing. She said, I'm hugging you like your mama. It's awesome, it's awesome. I have to tell you. You gonna hug me like my dad? Person can hug you if a woman can hug you. Come on, man. Come on, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That comes from a lot of people. Thank you. <laughs> if you'll give yourself to what I'm about to say, I promise you your life will never be the same. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Matthew 5.14 says, You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill that can't be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all that are in that house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So let me read a little. Ephesians 5, verse 8, starting in 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of these things that are done in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest in the light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you walk circumspectively, but not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, for the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. For this reason we also therefore since the day we heard it don't cease to get to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all the knowledge of it and spiritual and wisdom coming from our wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. God has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light. For He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Listen. We got married. And my mom, who put me in the home, I got out of Teen Challenge and I came home. And the first thing I needed to do, because I was mad at my mom, man, for putting me in there. My heart was changed. And I called her and I said, hey, mom, I left Teen Challenge. She goes, you what? And I told her. And I said, I'm not mad at you anymore. I really love you and I just want to thank you for being my mom. <laughs> you did the best that you knew how to do. And I just love you and I thank you. She goes, you're not mad? I said, no, I'm not mad. I'm in love. And I said, by the way, you can't be here because you got to work and you can't get here. But Jackie and I are getting married on Sunday. She goes, what? I said, yeah. I said, we're getting married. I called my dad. I said, dad. He said, what, son? I said, Jesus found me. I said, I'm 
not mad anymore. I love you. I'm not angry. Well, that's good. Why? Because I'm in love with Jesus. And I'm sorry. It's okay. No, Dad, I love you. All my relatives. I invited them to the wedding. None of them came. <laughs> now watch. There's a reason why I read that stuff. See, Bobby didn't die. My best friend. And we got married. And I heard in my heart, there was a very, I believe I heard, Bobby's not going to live. But it was an urgency that I needed to see him. And he was in a home called a brethren home. It was like a convalescent home. And he had a brain, a brain aneurysm, and they cut his skull away, and his head was all pushed out. And he's my best friend, you know? And so I went up to the place where he was at. I took my daughter, my little one, and uh, she came with me. And we went into the room, and she saw Bobby, you know, and I saw him. And I, I just was, like, overwhelmed because, see... I claimed Jesus and I was the only one that had a voice into his life I was the only one that he really looked up to and listened to and I talked it but I never walked it <laughs> and Bobby is not home and I went into the room and I said I'm sorry I'm sorry and he's not there he can't hear me he's just in a, he's dying you know he's you know how He's not home, you know? And I was sin conscious for about 30 seconds probably. It seemed like a long time. As I looked into his eyes, I saw all the times, hey man, Jesus loves you. Hey man, give me a hit. Hey man, Jesus loves you. He heard me swearing and freaking out on my family, coming downstairs. And he never got to see what it was like for a Christian to walk. And he's right in front of me. And he's dying. And I said, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. And Betty was there, his wife, who's an atheist. And I said, Betty, I'm sorry. She goes, for what? I said, because Jesus is real. Jesus? Jesus, look at him. Look at him. And you're going to tell me Jesus? And I said, he's real. Don't talk to me about Jesus. She walked to the corner of the room. She faced the corner. And I said, I'm sorry. See, what we don't understand is that life isn't a guarantee. We don't think about this stuff until it's too late. And if I can probe your heart in a way to where you wouldn't have a Bobby be in your life, it would be really powerful. Because everybody knows somebody that's not believing. And sometimes we're afraid to share the love of God with somebody. Because we're afraid how they might feel. Or we're afraid what they might say. Or we're afraid we're going to get persecuted. Or we're afraid they might respond bad. But really, what does that matter? All eternity. All eternity. So I'm just apologizing. I sang, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bobby. I'm sorry singing loud in the home. It's loud. Betty's like, ah. and I hugged him. He's not home. And next morning he died. <laughs> it rocked me, man. <laughs> it rocked me in such a way to where it marked me to never be a hypocrite again. See, you can't bite your lip and not be one. But you can fully surrender yourself to God. And say, you know what? I'm done. I want you, Jesus. I want you. I'm sick of this. I want you. And give yourself completely. I'm not talking about just praying a prayer. I'm talking about surrender. Because it's got to start here. Because you know, the reality is, is I can teach you how to pray for the sick and people will get healed because you pray for them. But it's not okay to be in condemnation and, and to be in a place of guilt and shame and condemnation and not know who you are. Because you can still do the stuff and still be a hypocrite. You can still do the stuff and you can stand before him one day and do the stuff and cast out demons and heal the sick and everything. And stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things? 
and him say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. See, when you know him, iniquity isn't an issue because you know him. And we can't afford to stand before him and do the stuff and get shut out. Very important, man. It's important to know him. So he died the next day, and I get this call from Betty. She calls me. She says, Todd. She goes, we want you to speak at Bobby's funeral. You were his only real friend. And I just cried. I said, what, what am I going to say? In my heart, I'm saying that. I'm like, I'll, I'll call you. She goes, okay. The, the funeral home, the director of the funeral home is going to be calling you. I just wanted to give you a heads up. She goes, you were his only friend. The only one that meant anything to him. Oh, and I was like, ah! So I, I talked to the funeral. The pastor called me. The, the family was going to get a pastor to do the funeral. The pastor called me and he said, Todd, what are you going to say? I said, all I can tell you is that I was blind, man. And now I really see. And if I'd have saw what I saw now, if I'd have seen then, I would have lived differently. I would have, I would have walked differently. Because a real friend lays down his life for his friend, so his friend doesn't have to lay it down. And he said, that's good enough for me. So I went to the funeral, and there wasn't a big funeral. It was about 40 people there. But his two kids sat in the front row. Three and a half, seven and a half. Zombied. Not even home. And Bobby is in the casket behind me. My best friend. Best friend, man. And I just, I just, I'm like, I didn't understand the healing thing. I didn't get it in any of that stuff. All I knew is that my heart was marked. And I looked into them kids' eyes, and I said, I can't tell you where your daddy is right now. It's true. It's the hardest thing I ever did. You understand, they're seven and a half and three and a half years old. And I have to tell them that I don't know if your daddy's in hell right now or in heaven. But when he died, the day before... He told me that he didn't believe in Jesus. And there's only one name under heaven that men can be saved. And I'm sorry. They didn't even hear me. They did, but they didn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> Little Bray walks up to the casket. Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> Your life means something to somebody. We can't afford to go on living for us. And I preached the gospel. The best way I knew how. And I told what it was like to be a friend. See, because it's all cool. And we can be all cool. And we can be decent in front of people. And we can look real cool in front of people. What's it like when you're being real cool in front of your friend that commits suicide? That doesn't get you anywhere. And it has you live with guilt for the rest of your life. Stop now. And I shared, and 20 people gave their life to Jesus that day, half the funeral. And I'm not talking about my good preach, man. I'm talking about the reality of not being a hypocrite anymore. That's what I'm saying. 